uh, thank you to the organizer for having me here. Uh, we have seen how Dr. Chun demonstrated all the nice and perfect way of doing your money. So I'll be sharing the modified techniques when things are not perfect. So the, the perfect Yamane technique requires a perfect combination of instruments uh, with or without a good assistant. But if we are lacking in one of it, we can still do the surgery, of course, but with a bit of modification. So in other words, when do we need to use the modified technique? Uh, probably when we don't have the perfect set of instruments. Uh, if we encounter difficulties, especially during our first few cases, uh, and when the surgery is uh, not a straightforward surgery and probably a combined kind of surgery. So before I proceed further, allow me to highlight the needle issue and also double pertaining to the double needling technique which was suggested by Mr. Yamane. So the 30 gauge thin wall needle has a larger lumen compared to the standard needle. So in our center, we have to bring it in from Singapore and yet we still haven't received it until now. Um, and we are still make do of our standard 27 gauge needle, uh, which is probably the closest in size compared to the 30 gauge thin wall needle. So as we can see, although the figure is seems like more or less the same, but bear in mind the 27 gauge standard needle is actually still bigger in size uh, in terms of the inner diameter, inner diameter as well as the outer diameter. Now, let's look at one of the YouTube video. Um, this is a double needling technique. The surgeon was using the 30 gauge needle, engaging both haptics at the same time and externalizing it concurrently. So, uh, we were using a 27 gauge needle. So we were trying to simulate the same uh, technique. Uh, we attempt, attempted it a couple of times and we end up getting the same problem over and over again. Um, either we lose one end of the haptic uh, or we end up having a bit of ballooning of the conjunctiva, so uh, and 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 end up having to dissect the conjunctiva to assess the uh, haptic underneath. So, in conclusion, we think that you no, know, if we, you are using the twenty seven gauge needle, uh, probably it's not the optimum needle to use for this particular technique, and probably the best way is if we externalize the haptic individually rather than the double needling technique for the 27 gauge needle. So let's go through in detail of the various techniques. Uh, this will be an overview of my discussion today. So we will be looking at how to deal with the leading haptic first technique. And there was another technique proposed by Dr. Brian Kim to externalize the trailing haptic first. And there's also a way to externalize the haptic by using a trocar. And finally, we'll look at some of the special condition whereby we'll probably be using some mix and match technique. Now, let's look at how we deal with the leading haptic. Uh, before we go into more detailed description, let us look at one important factor which will determine the technique that we're going to use, uh, which is the type of injector. So I did not realize it is important in this technique until we try a few lenses. So basically, we have two types of injector for the PVDF haptic, IOL. So we have the screw injector by uh, Carl Zeiss, the EC3, and we also have the single hand injector from Kowa and Biotech. So obviously, the screw injector requires two hands for the incision of lens, uh, whereas the single hand injector allow us to have one hand free uh, during the step. So why is this, inject is this injector seems to be important? Uh, we analyze most videos in the YouTube. So if you want to insert the haptic directly into the needle, which I call it as a one-step technique, uh, we need to do the injection of IOL with one hand and hold the needle in position with the other hand. So it sounds like you are only using two hands. Uh, this could be true if you are actually using a single hand injector. Um, but what if you have to use a screw type of injector. So we will be using both hands to inject the lens. And obviously now we need a third hand to help to hold the needle in position. So again, we can do this if you have a reliable assistant. Uh, he or she can either hold the needle in place for us or help to screw in the IOL. Uh, but then what happens if we don't have the assistant all the time? So we have a various options. So if we happen to have a screw type of injector with a good assistant, uh, probably we can do the single step injecting technique uh, but without a good assistant maybe we might need to consider to park the lens somewhere in the eye as step number one then only thread in the haptic into the needle as step number two 
So for me, I am not fortunate to have an assistant all the time. So I always prefer to do the one-step technique. Uh, but then I will opt for the single hand injector. I think it's more of the surgeon preference. Uh, you can use any type of injector as long as you're aware that we might need to adjust uh, some of our technique of insertion at the beginning. Now, so if we decided to part the haptic in the lens, so we can either place it behind the iris or we can place it anterior to the iris. So let's look at this uh, particular video. Uh, the surgeon choose to inject the lens behind the iris. Uh, one of the reasons why some surgeons like to do this is because you will have more space uh, to manipulate the lens. And then be careful that we need to ensure that the trailing haptic is always outside the eye so that we will not drop the lens inside the eye. Then only we will create create the canal, uh, sorry, create the tun tunnel and uh, using a forcep to trade in the haptic into the needle. So that is one way of doing it. Another way is by placing the IOL in the anterior chamber. Uh, I prefer to do it this way, whereby you inject the lens uh, in front of the iris, park it at the angle. Of course, you can do this if you have a normal angle. And... Uh, reposition it so that you can have access of the haptic and then only using a forceps to uh, trade in the needle. Uh, personally, I have a few concerns with the retropopular injection because uh, as we know, we will be working within the anterior hyaluronic area so potentially it might cause traction on the retina. Uh, viewing can be quite challenging at times, not because not only because it is behind the iris, but also it might be beyond the focal point of the microscope. And lastly, we might drop it down if we are not careful enough to hold the uh, training habit. So uh, I do feel that placing the lens in front of the iris is a safer technique to, to, to do. Now, um, let's look at other technique. Now, the other technique was popularized by Dr. Brian Kim. So we'll be externalizing the training haptic first before the leading haptic. So uh, just to make a comparison, this is when you externalize the leading haptic, you get the first haptic out. And then only you deal with trailing haptic. Uh, another way uh, to do it is by keeping the leading haptic outside the eye first. Settle the trailing haptic. And then only you uh, secure the leading haptic. So let's, let's go through the technique. Uh, this is a case of a post-retractomized eye. This was uh, after removal of oil and uh, and we decided to insert the square fixated lens. So uh, we create a paracetesis 180 degree away from the main wound and using a forcep pulling out the uh, haptic, park it outside and then using the forcep to trade in the trading haptic. And then once we have uh, secured the trailing haptic, then only we create the tunnel for the second haptic. Now push back the leading haptic inside and then trade it into the needle. So in general, this step probably gives more space and suitable for PMM haptic as it gives a bit more uh, space by keeping both haptic outside the eye because um, I think this, this technique was popularized by Dr. Brian Kim because he feels that dealing with training haptic is quite tricky. So might as well, you know, uh, he tried to sort of manipulate and see whether there's a better way of dealing with it. And number two, uh, in the initial step of... Uh, I mean, during when we first uh, learned to do the Yamane, you know, some surgeon was actually using the PMME haptic, which is quite rigid. So this is one of the techniques uh, which I think is uh, give a bit more space for us to deal with the probably the rigid haptic, the PMME. Uh, initially, I thought I will not repeat this uh, technique in other cases because I still find the leading haptic first is much more easier to do. Um, but interestingly... Uh, recently, we had a case, uh, this is a complicated cataract surgery, um, which was one of the training cases. 
the lens was actually placed in the sulcus, but at the same time, there was a significant amount of peripheral cortex inside the remaining bag. So, and at the same time, you can see the IOL is actually sublicated inferiorly. So we go in again, and in this particular, particular case, we have to do two things. So one is to clean up the remaining uh, cortex, and number two is to uh, fixate the sublicated IOL. So we decided to use the same lens, and hopefully we do not need to extend the corneal wound. Uh, so what we did is, uh, first thing first, we have to bring both haptics into the anterior chamber. So we did that by using the uh, viscoelastic. As you can see, I'm creating another parasynthesis uh, opposite to the main wound. So we bring out the uh, both haptics into the anterior chamber. And then the externalize the leading haptic to the limbal wound. and proceed with cleaning up the remaining cortex as well as the remaining vitreous. So we did the limited anterior protectomy in this particular case. So once we are done, um, we proceed with uh, creating the tunnel for the trailing haptic. So in this particular case, we decided to use the trailing haptic first. So, um, With a forcep, grasp the uh, haptic and thread it into the uh, needle. Uh, cauterize the haptic and proceed with the externalizing the leading haptic. You now, as you can see, I keep injecting the viscoelastic because uh, every time before you start to manipulate the eye, uh, we always need to make sure the eye trigger is good so that you will not get into trouble. Uh, during the manipulation inside the eye. So we are pushing back the leading haptic inside using the handshake technique, then passing one uh, passing the haptic from one hap from one forcep to the other and uh, threading in the uh, leading haptic to the needle and externalize it safely. So I suppose um, it is a nice alternative technique, especially if you end up having this kind of cases. So, um, I love this technique in this particular case, and so I'm glad I did the technique, so I don't have to uh, ex explore the lens and, and create uh, another bigger wound. Now, let's look at another technique. Uh, this time, we'll be using a trocar. Uh, just to share that trocar is actually available as a loose item. So, uh, we don't really have to buy the big bulk of the vitrectomy set to get the access of the troca, so we can just buy the troca. Um, and now, uh, let's look at another way of, of externalizing the haptic by using the troca. For example, in this particular case, it was a case of dislodged as IOL, and after completing the vitrectomy, we proceed with injecting the lens into the eye, so I decided not to create another extra wound. Uh, since the trocar is already inside, might as well use it uh, for the tunnel. So by using a Medscape forcep, we grasp the leading haptic inside the eye while injecting the lens and again, uh, still keeping the training haptic outside. Slowly retract the trocar while keeping the forceps inside the eye. And once the trocar is off, we slowly externalize the haptic and cauterize it. So the beauty of this technique, uh, it is very simple, uh, good control of the uh, procedure and but of course um, I have to create another wound for the uh, training haptic. Uh, another beauty thing about this procedure is we are able to um, uh, you know we don't have to dissect conjunctiva so um, no cutting is needed so we can still use it as a transcleral fixation of IOL without the need to cut down the uh, conjunctiva. Now I find it also useful to use the same technique in case we have a situation whereby the haptic uh, is dislodged, especially after we have created a flange. Uh, occasionally we might end up with this situation, especially in the first few cases. Um, expect 
that might happen. So at least we know what to do. Um, sometimes when we are externalizing the second haptic, in case we have you know created a flange for the first haptic, we might sort of probably accidentally uh, give too much of uh, uh, force that causes the initial haptic to dislodge inside the eye. So again, we are using a trocar. Because if you can imagine when you already have a flange, you cannot sort of thread in the haptic uh, to the needle easily. So, you know, this is one of the techniques. Manually grasp the haptic and with a conjunctival forcep, remove the haptic by leaving the forcep still inside the eye, then only externalize it, then cauterize it. Again, uh, we're able to do it without having the need to dissect the conjunctiva. So this uh, was a case referred to us for failed externalization of the second haptic. Um, as we can see, patient patient was not cooperative according to the surgeon during the first surgery. So when we received the case, the apparently the IOL was anchored nicely on one end and the other haptic was actually dangling in the vitreous cavity. So in order to correct this, we need to gain access of the dangling haptic, bring it back to the anterior chamber. So, um, but then the anchored haptic is stuck in nicely in the scleral bed. So what we need to do is we need to partially dissect the conjunctiva, uh, sorry, partially dissect the sclera to gain access of the dangling haptic. Um, so we slowly bring up the intraocular lens back into the anterior chamber. Uh, this one, uh, because the flange, the, the, the haptic was not yet uh, uh, cauterized. The dangle haptic was still a clean haptic with no flange. So we managed to bring it up to the anterior chamber and uh, just by using a needle, uh, we were able to uh, externalize the haptic safely. So looking back on the hindsight, I think probably in this particular case, what actually happened is uh, the initial the initial externalized haptic was stuck in too early, maybe, uh, probably even before the externalization of the second haptic. Because ideally, the best thing to do is to keep both haptic loose uh, and and make sure that leading haptic is outside the eye. Uh, even after we have created the flange. Yeah? And only after we have externalized both haptics outside the eye, then we secure both flange underneath the sclera bed, so, or within the sclera bed. So one of the reasons why what happened in this particular case, because the first haptic was fixed uh, at the beginning of the surgery, there will be a very much limited space uh, for the surgeon to maneuver the second haptic and to externalize it safely. So... Probably that was what happened in this particular case. And this is just to highlight the importance of proper measurement or else you might end up with slightly misaligned optic as such as in this case. You know, ideally it should be on this one end should be here, the other end should probably be here. So this was what was a bit uh, misaligned. So the optic uh, appeared to be slightly uh, off-centered. Uh, another uh, case whereby uh, I think what happened in this particular case is one haptic is probably measured at 2 millimeter and the other haptic probably measured at 1.5 or 3. So that also will end up having an apparent kind of um, longer haptic in one side. So in this particular case, uh, we have to cut off uh, tip of the haptic so that it shorten a bit. Uh, just to get the optic uh, centrally uh, positioned. So sometimes some of these uh, kind of cases uh, will end up in, in such a way. So at least we know what to do if we encounter those kind of uh, situations. So this is what Mr. Yamane has actually written in one of his paper. The technique is simple but not easy. Uh, but the good thing is the learning curve is not steep. So thank you.